Okay, I'm going to try to finish Hebrews 7. This will probably be shorter. Um, I just wanted to address this part separately. I've been slowing down with my YouTube channels the last few days just because I had stomach issues. I went to a doctor today. Uh, we're getting there, but the um, Lord's taking care of me, and I'm just trying not to do anything stressful. <laughs> and most videos I do that are not these studies. It's interesting. These book studies, mainly the only people who read these are, or watch these are the ones who actually enjoy the ministry of the Word. The others, where I'll do one-offs about topical stuff, different people float to them. And those those usually end up producing some kind of argument in the thread and somebody calling me a heretic and somebody doing a video about me and blah, 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 blah. And that can be kind of stressful, actually. So the last few days, because of the... I don't know if I've got an ulcer or what, but um, with my stomach issues, I've just tried not to go there too much. Um, anyway... Hebrews 7, we're going to talk about Jesus as, one of the things is the surety of a better testament. And I wanted to deal with it separately, uh, just because I felt the last one had so much in it. Um, so I'll pick up at verse 20. Inasmuch as not without an oath he was made a high priest, or he was made a priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this one with an oath by him that said to him, Thou Lord shall, the Lord swore and will not repent, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So remember, there's a better promise and a, and a hope, a better hope by which we draw near to God. And this hope perfects us, right? The Old Testament could not make anything perfect, perfect, verse 19, but the bringing in of a better hope did by which we draw near to God. This hope is an anchor for our soul. This is the hope of the glory of God in which we rejoice. And this hope is guaranteed by the oath where God swore that this Christ would fulfill a priestly role for us after the order of Melchizedek, and he comes with bread and wine. He's already offered up his sacrifice. Okay, so now he's coming to us with bread and wine to minister himself as life to us. And that life is the glory and will saturate our whole being and bring us into glory so that we will be the sons of God manifested in glory. Um, and then he says, by so much, by this oath, Jesus was made the surety of a better covenant or testament. Now, the surety, the first time we see that word is in Genesis. And it's this beautiful story. Well, it shows up a few, few times, but the main point where you really see it acted out is the beautiful story where Joseph, you know, he'd been slow, he'd been sold into slavery, and now he's the king, he's been exalted, he's the king of, uh, well, he's second to the king, and he's administering a stewardship, right, of all the riches of Egypt to, uh, to feed the hungry and everything. There's a famine in the land, Jacob sends his 11 uh, 10 remaining children. He keeps Benjamin because Benjamin and Joseph are both the son of sons of Sarah. And they're his favorites. And Benjamin is the only, uh, only one left from her. So, uh, I'm sorry, not Sarah, Rachel. And, uh, he treasures Benjamin and says, he, you're not going. I mean, I already lost one son, right? Well, he sends the 10 to go in to get um, to see the food and get food. And Joseph hides his identity from him, and there's this whole drama that spills out. And then uh, he says, wait, you're not going anywhere. I think you're all spies. Which is interesting, because it's ten. It's like the ten spies going into the land. I never really thought of that before. But anyway, he accuses them of being spies, right? And he says, you know, until you show me your other brother, I'm not going to believe you. You know, you're not getting anything. And Judah speaks up and says, you know, no, this will kill my father. He's already lost one son. You can't do this. And he's like, nope, unless, unless you bring me Benjamin, you'll by no means see any food. So they go back and they talk to uh, Jacob. And he's like, no, you can't have Benjamin. You already lost my other son. And he's like, we're going to die out here unless we do. 
And jo- Judah sh- sh- speaks up and says, I will be a surety for him. If anything happens to him, my blood will be required. Right? And so he puts his life on the line for Benjamin. And so Jacob lets him go. And Benjamin goes and Joseph, you know, gives Benjamin preferential treatment. He gets uh, five times the food as everybody else. The number of grace, interestingly. And uh, then as they're leaving with all the food, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the corn and, and the what they came for. Joseph had a steward put a silver cup in Benjamin's sack and then came out and accused them of stealing the silver cup. And sure enough, they find it in Benjamin's sack. So he's now considered guilty of stealing. And now they're, you know, his life is going to be forfeit. Judah stands up and says, no, I gave my life as a surety. And then he confesses the whole thing. You know, we we had a brother and we lost him and we killed him. And uh, it was our fault. We This sin was on our hands. And now you, I can't let this happen to Benjamin. I, he stands up for him as his surety. and says, take me instead. And when that happens, it breaks Joseph's heart, right? And Joseph, at that moment, reveals himself to them, which is a picture of the revelation of Christ to the tribes of Israel when he pours out his spirit of grace and supplications upon them and they see him who they've pierced. It's a beautiful reunion that's coming up. And it's interesting that the pattern of the surety precedes the revelation of Joseph's identity. And to me, the surety is the most comforting. And once you see that Christ is your surety, you know you are secure. And what he's doing to prepare us to meet him and prepare us to have him reveal himself to us is to show himself as the surety. And remember, as Melchizedek, he came out of Judah. Judah's the one who stood as a surety for Benjamin. And Benjamin is sort of like a picture of us, I think. And Joseph, I'm sorry, and Jesus coming out of Judah, now is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek and the power of an incorruptible life. And he is our surety. He's the surety of a better testament. And that means that he has put his life on the line. He, on the one hand, he died for our sins. That redemption is accomplished. But now he stands there as a surety. You say, how secure is my salvation? Well, the Son of God has said, if anything happens to any of these, Father, be it unto me. It's my life on the line. This is a covenant between Jesus and the Father. It's called the everlasting covenant. And that is what his shepherding is based upon. It's not a covenant directly with us. For us, it's a testament. It's an inheritance. Uh, because the, we'll see that the death of the testator has already happened and therefore there's a will and we've, we've become heirs. And the fact is that Jesus has guaranteed that we will come into the inheritance. He will lose none of us. To lose one of us would mean that we would fall short of the glory, not be raptured, not make it to the end, not be glorified, not be brought home as a son in glory. If he doesn't bring us home, he's promised his own life as our surety. Just as Judah told the told Jacob, hey, if anything happens to Benjamin, I won't let it. I'll put my own life on the line. It'll be required of my blood. You know, my blood will be required. That's what Jesus has done for us. Not only, it's like his death on the cross prepared him to put his life on the line for us forever. It's it's so deep, it's hard to even get words around it. How much he has given himself for us. He loved me and gave himself for me. Not, yes, just once in the offering for the atonement. But there is absolutely no way that anything can happen to me because my surety is incorruptible and imperishable and cannot die, right? And he's put that life on the line for me. 
And he's not going to be able to lose me. He's not going to lose me. He's guaranteed my salvation. This is the new hope. This is what's backed by an oath. This is the promise and the oath, the two immutable witnesses in which it is impossible for God to lie. This is what backs the high priesthood of Jesus, which is our guarantee that he will bring us into glory, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for us. And we can rest because it's done. It's a done deal. And this hope is what purifies us, right? The law couldn't purify us, but the bringing in of a better hope. What does that sound like? First John, we know that when we see him, we shall be as he is, and whoever has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. What hope do we have? The hope of being conformed to the image of Christ, which is to be brought into his glory and see him face to face in joy. And we will. And you know what? I believe God is is in the grace of, outpouring that's happening right now where he's defining the doctrine of grace not just for the theologians for the but for the average joe housewife he's showing himself doctrinally as our surety maybe not everybody's getting it from hebrews 7 but we're getting it we are getting the fact that he is our surety and we are secure in him and that is a precursor to him revealing himself just like when jo judah spoke up for benjamin in front of Joseph, Joseph turned and revealed his identity to them. So I felt like it's prophetic. I, you know, right now it just seems prophetic that this is the kind of truth we're enjoying. Uh, and they, uh, let's see, verse 23, and they truly were many priests because they had not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continues forever, as an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by him, seeing he lives forever to make intercession for them. How much will he save you? He'll save you all the way to the uttermost, to the uttermost. There's no, there's not a word that we have that says all the way more than uttermost. And he has guaranteed as our surety to save us to the uttermost. He's put his life down. You, He is busy interceding. He ever lives to make intercession for you. He is, every breath you take is backed by his intercession. Every turn you make to him is backed by his intercession. Every time you're conscious of him, every time you find a song in your heart to Jesus, every time you turn in inwardly and say, oh Lord Jesus, I love you. Or, oh Lord Jesus, help me. Or, oh Lord Jesus, I feel far from you. Oh Lord Jesus, save me. That is backed by his intercession. That's his drawing. That's his shepherding work. That is you coming back to him. That's you being drawn in to the presence within the veil by your high priest. He's so much more active in your experience than you realize, than you go, than we give him credit for. Uh, last night I went to bed singing some songs. I mean, just like in my heart, not with my mouth, but it was like a song that was being composed in the spot. And it was real simple. And it was just like, I can't wait to see you, Lord. I mean, it was really simple, but I knew it came from him. It, it was my spirit responding to his drawing. How much more when we see him, is it going to be the realization of how much he worked in us is going to blow us away. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. On the one hand, he's the highest. He's so holy. He's harmless. He's not going to harm you. He's so tender. I see the, in the word harmless, it's like, that means you can run to him, you know? Even though he's holy. Even though he's undefiled. Even though he's separate. Even though he's higher than the heavens, he's harmless to those who believe. And he needs not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For he did this once when he offered up himself. For the law makes men high priests which have weakness. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, makes the son who is consecrated forevermore. So his offering up of himself, there was an atoning aspect, right? 
But there's so many, his offering was so multifaceted. And one aspect of his offering was his offering up of his life to be our perpetual high priest and our surety. And uh, he bore our punishment which was due to us. He became our surety. He really did suffer the punishment. He really did put his blood on the line. He didn't need to suffer. That was him stepping in. And see, this is, this is, that's why I say it's not an everlasting, it's, it's not a covenant that he makes directly with us. If you believe, then I'll become your surety. No, this is an everlasting covenant with the father for the sheep that he knew before the foundation of the world, that he would become their surety and guarantee their salvation. And, you know, you can argue with me about predestination and whether or not you have a choice and all that. If that offends you, I'm sorry. But the Father knew you from the foundation of the world and sent his Son as a surety to bring you back to glory, to bring you to glory. And he, as your surety, he had to redeem you with blood because there was a silver cup found in your sack and you really did steal it. <laughs> your life was forfeit. And justice was served, but not on you, on your surety. Just as Judah was ready to give his life for Benjamin, Jesus really did give his life for us. Okay, that's it. Thank you.